Uh, good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, thanks, yes. Uh, thank you very much, sir, and good afternoon, Mr. Folks. Uh, we were, um, before lunch, uh, looking at what you described in your witness statement and in some of the contemporaneous documents as informal access to some information and some documents that um, ICL Pathway allowed you to see. Uh, can I look at um, some examples of that, please? Mm -hmm. Can we turn up, please, WITN 0597-0143? Thank you. And if we just look at the top of the page, we can see that this is a fortnightly report from you to Mr. Mayor, is that right? Yeah. And did you produce these on a fortnightly basis? Uh, yes, or thereabouts. And what was the purpose of them? Um, John was leading the products assurance area, so it was a fortnightly reporting of progress and issues. At this point, I was doing work for two people uh, for John and for Gareth Lewis, who uh, um, headed up the Ford and Security Group on the programme for BA, uh, and so I was splitting my time between the two, so it was also uh, just trying to justify, um, if you like, what time I was spending for each of the two bosses I had. And at this um, stage, um, what was his, uh, Mr Mayor's, um, position? Um, I think the group at that point was called um, Design Assurance, and so he was, I think, um, Manager of Design Assurance. That may not be quite the right name, but that was um, the gist of his role. Was he next up the chain from yes. you? And do you know what um, happened to these reports? Uh, I presume that key issues from them were then fed um, Further up the chain. And by further up the chain, um, where do you uh, mean? Um, I presume, I'm just trying to work out what the structure would have been at that point, but to either the programme director or the deputy programme director at that point. So Mr Miller? Uh, at that point in 1998, may have still been a, a benefits agency. Um, as Peter Crayon, I think, was the... Um, the uh, programme director at that point. And can we look at the foot of the page, please, under paragraph three? You say current issues and concerns, testing stroke acceptance, documentation from PDA testing at Borough. Uh, does that mean Borough, um, uh, the place in London? Okay, the, the post office had a a uh, site, I think it was a, um, like a, an industrial unit or warehouse that was used as a, for test equipment, and that was at Borough. I.e. the place in London? Yes. Um, remodel office and end-to-end. -end. Can you just explain briefly what model office and then end-to-end -end are? So these were two different uh, test phases or test activities. Uh, model office was actually trying to uh, operate like a, a post office, a, Presumably would have had two or three terminals and trying to do real transactions and look at the uh, processing within the office environment. End-to-end uh, -end would have been uh, trying to look at the process from uh, transactions being performed in the office and then feeding all the way up through the central systems and onwards to, uh, I presume, uh, TIP or the um, relevant uh, benefits agency systems. Uh, still steadfastly ignoring anything to do with acceptance. Hopefully, will be some change of direction following the week-long workshop this week, given Mary's involvement. Who was Mary? Um, Mary was a... I, I can't remember her surname, but I believe she was a contractor, probably from PA, who was working for the programme. And I think she was looking at testing. Um, what this is is actually probably more of a, um, a sort of internal issue uh, regarding 
you know, the, the, those two test groups down at Borough were trying to put together tests. Uh, my concern was these may have been valid uh, tests to test the functionality of the system, but they weren't uh, tied in in any way to what was going to need to happen with acceptance. And given the big hurdle we knew was going to happen, obviously at this point we thought it was going to happen sooner than 1999, but the big hurdle that the programme needed to get through would be acceptance, uh, we were trying to look at how testing and acceptance would work together. Thank you. The next bullet point. <coughs> Release to an acceptance, given the nature of the hangouts for NIAL 2, a significant number of acceptance criteria, e.g. for security, are likely to be unacceptable until a subsequent release. Are we content that we understand the contractual and other implications, re-op trial, rollout, etc., of partial acceptance, acceptance? Can you explain to us what you meant by that bullet point? Nile 2 was the name of a release um, in the same way that we had releases called Congo, which I think were the, um, uh, the initial trial was a release called Congo. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the release called Nile was, but it was obviously the release that was coming up at about that time of a wider system. Um, the concern there was that a number of the acceptance criteria that... Um, we had around security weren't actually going to be satisfied <coughs> by Nile or Nile release two because Nile release two had been pared down. Therefore, the question I'm asking is: if we go ahead and do Nile two, that may be a, uh, a sensible process to go through to do iteratively get some functionality going. But if we didn't prove the acceptance criteria, we wouldn't be able to give them acceptance. Um, so we need to, as a program, have a joined up approach to whether we were giving them some partial acceptance, whether we were giving it some sort of acceptance needed to be then rerun, or whether for the purpose of, of Nile we weren't giving acceptance at all. I understand. And then if we just scroll down, there are um, three bullet points that are all to do with um, EPOS, and I just want to concentrate on those, please. Okay. Um, the first of them, EPOS application. Um, evidence emerging from the EPOS workshops that the emerging product is likely to be non-conformant in a number of areas and will miss the brackets possibly unwritten business rules in a larger number of areas. The product does not appear to be at the stage one would expect given the closeness to its entry to a testing phase. Pathway admitted to several holes where they don't yet have a solution, e.g. cash account. Just dealing with that um, first bullet point. Um, how serious an issue was that? Um, well, I would view that extremely serious because um, EPOS is one of the core parts of the system. Um, as background to this, at about this time, we did with we did attend a series of workshops that uh, were put together by the POCM applications team with Pathway. Um, I attended those from a sort of technical perspective. Um, these were workshops to take the programme people through the uh, emerging EPOS application. Um, this was kind of being done, given we didn't get any documentation at this point, then show us the thing and let, our, let us work through it. And um, that's obviously not a particularly good way of reviewing it, but it was an important thing to do. We went through it and found there were some... There was functionality that the relevant experts we got in there from POCL basically thought uh, was non-conformant uh, and in some cases uh, didn't appear to meet the business rules they were expecting. Uh, I think in the, the possibly unwritten bit I put in there is there was a, an, an issue with the detail of the requirements, partly I think because of the, the whole issue we talked about before lunch, about the level of requirements um, POCL did put in experts to try and help Pathway with some of the um, business functionality around EPOS in particular. So they may have helped them in sort of joint working, but they may not necessarily have been written down business rules at that point. What does the reference to the cash account um, mean? 
Okay, so the core, the key output that every office produced every week was a document called the cash account. Um, the, uh, it was a fairly complex document every office had to produce. Um, I've got one here if you want to see it, but it's a, um, it was their key financial report that went off to the centre, got keyed by Chesterfield, and then um, uh, was used for a whole series of purposes by the centre. Um, EPOS was meant to effectively replace the cash account by initially uh, electronically producing the cash account. Um, I think originally it was going to electronically produce and feed to tip, but also print for signature, and then eventually they would dispense with the paper copy. So the cash account was the key financial report coming out of the, um, the office. It had a whole series of steps that were needed to create the cash account that was done manually that every... Um, you know, 20,000 sub-postmasters uh, knew how to do manually, uh, and this had to be replicated by EPOS. And you were saying that Pathway were admitting that they didn't have a solution to the creation of the replacement for the cash account document? Yes. Was that um, issue resolved subsequently to your satisfaction? Um, it was an issue that was... <coughs> resolved in that, yes, they uh, did move on and were able to produce a cash account and the system wouldn't, couldn't have gone alive if it couldn't. Um, to my satisfaction, uh, because this was in the application area, I was sort of trying to pull together the things we were finding. That wasn't actually one that I was responsible for chasing through. So I can't say you know, I went back and spent the next six months working on the cash account. Yes, I believe it did get resolved. But what was of concern to us is that the date of this document, which was 1990... January 1998, 1998 um, which was meant to be fairly near to when you know, we were getting into detailed testing, that not being able to create the core accounting document out of the system at that point didn't bode well. Uh, the next bullet point on EPOS, EPOS design approach. Very concerned about Pathways' apparent design approach for EPOS which is totally inappropriate for an application of this complexity, appears to be based on reverse engineering a product, which has been cobbled together, first by someone who is no longer with Pathway, and left little documentation, and since by Isha. This is a very dangerous approach for a product of this nature and importance, and I do not believe that the risk can adequately, sorry, can be adequately mitigated through testing alone. Um, first of all, the some of the words that you use there, very concerned, totally inappropriate, and very dangerous. That's quite strong language. It is. Why, it, why did you use such strong language? So EPOS was the core uh, part of the system that was providing the accounting, providing the creation of the um, cash account and everything that went before before it in that process and was the key document where some postmaster or branch manager would report to the centre what they had. So it's fundamental to uh, POCL operating and being able to account for the, uh, the business and the money in its network. Um, EPOS is fairly complicated. Right? The, um, I saw Mr Scipione's um, report uh, and I felt it kind of underplayed a bit the complexity. It is more than just a POS system, or more than just simple accounting, because of the sheer complexity, there are 170, 180 different products that you could transact, different product types you could transact at the post office. Each one's got subtly different ways of being accounted for. The cash account form's complicated. Um, it's a, a complex piece of software, and you know, in my view, it needed to be properly uh, analysed and designed, uh, it wasn't something that should be just sort of put together from the user interface side, you know, or um, I, I see that use of RAD, Rapid Application Development, was talked about. You know, there are some bits of software which are suitable for that kind of approach, others that aren't. And which was this? <laughs> totally unsuitable for uh, the... Um, I, the emotive language cobbled together, but totally unsuitable for the... Um, try and put it together and, and write up design documentation afterwards. 
is and what. Can I just say? Yes. I had, in a previous <coughs> life, um, been technical manager on the Echo projects, which was to create the uh, effectively the EPOS project, which was used in um, uh, branch offices for a number of years. So I was aware of the. You know, I'm talking with some knowledge of the complexity of actually trying to automate that process. Is what you're describing this bullet point, the kind of run-of-the-mill issue that one might reasonably expect to see in the development of any large IT system? Oh, I certainly hope not, uh, because I would hope that anybody developing a large IT system would use the appropriate design approach for the complexity and importance of the, um, the piece of software they're producing. Are you raising here a fundamental issue about the competence and ability of your contractors? I probably can't answer no to that. I think I am, yes. Um, what, what was done about it? There were various approaches that we that were taken within the programme as far as joint working with them, as far as um, trying to get hold of design documentation, etc. I think our concern was that you know, we were finding this stuff out, finding it out the state of the product by doing this review very late in the day, not through reading their own design documentation. Some of what we were finding out here was from, if you like, rumour or what people said in unguarded moments rather than by official channels. You but, said, I'm sorry, go on. Um, but, you know, <coughs> this was, you know, reported up. I think it's now, seems to be backed up by other evidence that I've seen in the past 24 hours uh, that I hadn't seen at the time. Um, I don't personally know what pressure was applied to Pathway or what was taken forward with Pathway at this point. When you um, refer to having seen documents backing this up in the past 24 hours, are you referring in particular, we'll come to the document in a moment, to the um, ICL Pathways internal report on the EPOS Pinnacle Task Force? Yes, and also on the uh, CSR Plus audit, which uh, echoes some of the findings from that. You refer in this document, um, in the second bullet point, to um, the application being appear, appearing to be based on reverse engineering. You say appears to be based. On what was um, that founded? I think it was founded on uh, verbal questioning of the team during these workshops. So uh, these workshops were held. Uh, I was one of the people attending these workshops. We had, obviously, up to then, been trying to get hold of design documentation. We had uh, been denied it, possibly because it didn't exist. Uh, we then went into these meetings. There was um, you know, questions that we would have asked through these two or three workshops, uh, and we would have been asking these, work these questions of um, some of the staff who were there on the ground who would have given us possibly less guarded answers of management. What's the problem with um, reverse engineering this product? Well, what you've got here is a, a, a complex, um, complex requirement. It's got complex, uh, it's got um, strong requirements for integrity and reliability for obviously because it's handling the accounting within the office. It's got to be able to uh, function reliably under hostile conditions, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, what, they, what we found out, I think, by talking to the people there was that uh, they'd started putting a product together. They'd had... Um, it was unsuccessful. We uh, knew, I think, that uh, one of their developers who worked on it had left. They then tried to do further work on it. They shipped it over to Escher in Boston to, we were told, think, complete it. Um, 
I think complete probably meant quite a lot of rewriting. It would then come back again, and then from what it says here, it appears that then they tried to um, do more major work on it, reverse engineering what they'd already got. It, it's just not the way that you would want, expect a uh, product that's this mission critical to be produced. Can we turn to the third bullet point, please? <coughs> EPOS failure conditions. Significant concerns, reoperation of EPOS and the office platform in general during everyday failure conditions, such as loss of a terminal, terminal or uh, land local area network yes. um, connectivity, but similar issues likely to emerge in non-failure conditions with shared stock units. Pathways problem is basically that Repost gives high integrity for data held on a per-terminal basis, whereas the business requirement is for data to be accounted for on a per-SU stock unit yes. basis. They need to build the integrity for the latter using the facilities provided by the former trying to meet this need without a rigorous design method and without proper failure analysis is unlikely to succeed. Pathway appear not to understand the business impacts of failure of the accounting process as opposed to fa failure of a transaction and appear to want to rely on the quote, it's not going to happen, end quote, philosophy. Same may be true of other applications given release 1C experience but have um, less uh, visibility. Um, can you explain what you meant by the distinction that's drawn in this paragraph between a per terminal and a per stock unit accounting approach? Okay, so uh, per terminal, each counter position in the office has its own counter terminal, uh, which has its own um, in pathway solution. Um, uh, so the software with the post a message server which holds the message store which holds the data. That's fairly easy. However, what happens in post offices is post offices are organised uh, on a per stock unit basis, where stock unit generally meant the till draw. The best way of thinking of a stock unit is a till draw. So, you know, if you were working in a post office and you were working on position one in the morning, you would go and get your till draw out of the safe, go to position one work on it there. That's what you're responsible for, your stock unit. If in the afternoon you're in position three, you take the same draw to position three and working it there. At the end of the day, we want, or at the end of the week, you want to account for and balance your stock unit. And some of your stock unit's work will have been done on terminal one, some on terminal three, some somewhere else. So the challenge here was to come up with a, a, a ability to reliably, when there may be failures, for instance, the network, etc., come up with a reliable way in which you could actually um, balance stock units and account for stock unit data where somebody's moved around within the office. If everybody sat on the same terminal all the time, it would be much easier. But they don't, because post offices need the flexibility, multiple position offices need the flexibility for staff to be able to move around. Thank you. You say pathway appear not to understand the business impacts of failure of the accounting process and appear to want to rely on the it's not going to happen philosophy. You say in your witness statement that by this you meant that ICL pathway didn't demonstrate an understanding of the importance of the accounting role of EPOS, including the balancing of cash and stock in each post office. Is that right? That's what I meant, yes. And I can just say the distinction here is when we spoke to them, they understood the problems if the, a single transaction failed. So if you're in the middle of paying a bill and that bill, say the power went off or something went wrong during that particular transaction, they were uh, seemed to be uh, understanding that they needed to tidy up that situation, but less concerned around failure of the underlying accounting. So, 
for instance, if somebody had, say, worked on this position, then that position, then this position, then something had gone down. And when we tried to challenge them, the impression that I, I got when I wrote here is they were keener to do the, it's not going to happen, rather than to provide us with an explanation of how it was going to be solved. In, in writing this, had you got in mind any difficulties being caused for sub-postmasters being able accurately to account for their stock and cash at the end of account, an accounting period? Well, yes, because that's the whole purpose of um, the whole purpose of EPOS is for uh, sub-postmasters and managers to be able to account for the business and then report that back to the centre. So, in a sense, describing one of the very issues that this inquiry is inquiring into? Yes, I don't. Uh, I, this, at this point, um, Pathway did not demonstrate to us an understanding uh, of this, these, this kind of failure condition or how they were going to solve it. Um, that they, other people may have solved it, but certainly to us, as part of this piece of work, they hadn't demonstrated it to us. Um, I don't know whether this particular example is one of the problems which has hit downstream or not. But the, the point I'm making here is they didn't... You know, we, want, we wanted to be able to have um, proof that they had considered these failure conditions and because we knew that such failure conditions were going to happen. You refer to um, a preference to relying on the it's not going to happen um, philosophy. How was that expressed to you? Um, <coughs> I can't remember the exact words, but it would be... Um, I think what I meant by that was, you know, if we said, well, what happens if, for instance, the um, network breaks into two halves? Say you've got a large office... Um, depending on how the local area network in the office is configured, you could end up with uh, two half networks. That depends on how the network's actually put together. Um, that may not happen very often. It may only happen in large numbers of offices, but it still could happen. Um, therefore, you know, we wanted to ensure that they'd taken these things into account or shown us why they weren't going to happen. What we were seeing here, and it mirrors to a certain extent, what we found during the demonstrator, that there were, uh, rather than showing they'd addressed it, they were <coughs> preferred to deny it was going to happen. Now, um, you've expressed a view there that you wanted your concerns listened to and acted upon by ICL Pathway. In fact, at this time, uh, was there a proposal that contractual acceptance be tied, be changed, and tied to uh, authorization being given for NR2, new release 2? Yes, I believe there was. Can you just explain to us what um, contractual acceptance meant? Contractual acceptance was important because um, it basically would have said we were happy with the system, and I think it was important to... Um, pathway because it un unlocked a major payment <coughs> or I can't quite remember what it did but it was, it was important from a financial point of view um, maybe at this point because it was P till PFI didn't do that but acceptance was basically um, I think there were a series of stage payments so it was important for uh, Fujitsu to be able to achieve acceptance and then acceptance would then uh, be able to initiate the wrong out and obviously then the wrong out of the system then that moves us to the next stage and and the income stream um, what there appeared to be sorry the, uh, I should sorry to interrupt you this document can come down uh, what I believe you're referring to is there was a, a, a proposal that rather than having a formal uh, acceptance activity that they would tie it acceptance to the authorization of a specific release which i think was called nr2 what was nr2 uh, it was another it wasn't a full it wasn't the final release 
So I guess the key point here is if you wanted to accept, you might want to accept on the final thing you had. And the proposal that came forward was that we would actually, uh, acceptance would be timed to the release authorization of um, new release two, which was a, a not final release. And I think you uh, wrote a note setting out your opposition to that or um, outlining the dangers of ICL Pathways' proposal to tie um, contractual acceptance and the payment of money to them um, to a um, release I did. of NR2. Can we look at that, please, at WITN 0597-0119? Um, this is a single-page document authored by you. You say in your um, witness statement that you thought ICL Pathways uh, um, proposal was not a good idea, and you reduce your thoughts um, to writing. And this was in 1998. Can you, um, again, assist us with the date on this? Um... Unless I... Have I dated it at the bottom of the... Um, no, it's a single-page document. If you just scroll to the bottom, you can't see a date. It's document 119. Acceptance at... 119. Uh, it seemed to be the 12th of October, 1998. Thank you. And again, was that taken from the properties... That was taken for the properties. Yes. Thank you. If we just read it, um, you wrote, a suggestion has emerged that contractual acceptance could be given at new release two release authorization rather than waiting uh, for the completion of the formal acceptance process. This note seeks to outline likely dangers in this approach. In the first bullet point, you say the only contractual right the sponsors have to obtain any assurance that the ICL pathway service will um, meet the contract is via the acceptance process. Assurance without acceptance is not supported by the contract and has to date been only of limited effectiveness due to the reluctance of ICL pathway to provide access <coughs> to the detail of their solution. This situation has only been sustainable on the basis that the acceptance process would provide a backstop for assurance. And then skipping over the next one. Although a number of the tests used in the um, acceptance um, trials may have already been run in some form, many of the acceptance reviews will not have taken place before the release authorization board has sat. A large number of deliverables cited for acceptance review have yet been made available uh, to Horizon, as these are scheduled to be produced during the operational trial. And then the current approach will provide assurance to the release authorization board that the associated functionality will work. However, it will not prove the service deliverability. And then conclusion, the current acceptance process acts as a safety net for the contracting authorities, offering a level of protection from having to accept um, and roll out an inadequate service. We believe it would be very dangerous to accept any proposal which would remove the protection offered by the acceptance process. Uh, can you help us um, who this document was um, addressed to and seen by? Um, I obviously wrote it in a, in, a, in a hurry because a couple of typos in it. Um, I can't remember who I was asked to produce it for, but the uh, the same document has been disclosed back to me by the inquiry uh, with with a handwritten draft in the top right hand corner. So I know it reached um, somewhere up in the echelons of the uh, of the uh, PDA, as it would have been at that point. The program delivery authority. Yes, um, I presume it would have gone into uh, the contracts team or those who were ne negotiating uh, around um, the, the contract with Pathway at that point. I presume it would have been at the level of 
the um, programme director or immediately below. And can you recall what happened as a result of submitting this paper? I'm a little confused when I go and look at what was then agreed. I.e. Uh, in the acceptance board minutes. Yes. Uh, as to how it came out. Uh, I, I believe, um, you know, I believe that this paper reached the right people, but uh, from what I understood, the toned-down version, the, the, the acceptance board minutes may have been, the, the process may have been changed contrary to this advice. Can I turn to a new topic then, please? Um, the um, project mentors report. Um, can we turn up page 39 of your uh, witness statement, please? WITN 0597100 at page 39. And you say in 114, there was a review performed by, uh, of the programme by Bird and Bird. I'm going to skip what's in brackets, given your correction earlier. Okay. And a consultancy called Project Mentors in March 1998, uh, for which I believe I was interviewed. And you refer to um, um, an exhibit, um, which you exhibit as your 32nd um, uh, document. And then in 115, you say, I can't remember seeing the report at the time it was produced, but was invited to comment on it by Pockle Management in January 1999 and largely supported its findings. My notes from reviewing the report are presented um, as, um, and then you describe them and exhibit those as your 33rd um, exhibit. Um, can we just um, look at your notes to start with then please. WITN uh, you just look at your um, notes, um, they're said to be prepared in contemplation of litigation at the, um, at the top right. I, I put that on there just because the document I'd been sent had that on and I... I was going to ask you why with that. I, it was, I was probably being lazy with the same marking as it were. And um, if we um, scroll down, I don't think there's a date on them. but I think in your statement you date them as being from January 99. Yes. And then if we just scroll back up again, please, at the notes and look at the first bullet point, there's a quotation in italics, effective business requirements analysis is required to achieve. It, it, was that a quote from the report? Yes. And then you're commenting on it underneath? Yes. Um, and we can see the way that it continues in the second and third bullet points with an italicised quote and then some comments by you. Um, none of um, those italicised comments appear in the March 98 version of the Project Mentors report. <coughs> I wonder whether we could instead look at the same time as looking at this document at poll triple zero three double eight two nine. And then skip um, to page nine. 
in the document on the right hand side. And if you just scroll down a little bit, we can see this is a, um, a 17th of December 98 version of the Project Mentors report. And then if we scroll forwards, please, to page 11, and then scroll to 1.3 on the right-hand side. Can you see a sentence under scope? Effective business requirements analysis is um, needed to achieve a satisfactory, comprehensive business design. This can then be used as the basis for, a give or take a word or two, that matches what you've written on the left-hand side. Okay, my apologies, um, I may be referencing the wrong document. I just wanted to establish whether that was so. so drawing those threads together, it looks like your notes on the left are a commentary on or a response to the December 98 Project Mentors report rather than the earlier March 98 version. Would that appear to be correct? Uh, it does appear like that, yes. Okay. I don't think I was necessarily aware there were two Project Mentors reports. So I see we've got them modelled up. Can we go to the substance of what Project Mentor said then um, and go to page 13 of the document on the right-hand side and look at the conclusions. We can um, lose the document on the left-hand side to make it easier to read, please. Um, it must be remembered that so far we only have performed the requirements analysis for BPS. BPS is? Um, benefit Payment Service, which was the overall name for both <coughs> the BA and the possible parts of the benefit payment. Which is predominantly a BA system element. However, from our analysis, we conclude that Pathway made no attempt to undertake requirements analysis in accordance with normal industry practice. This, despite their having access to the SSR and subsequent requirements since April 1996, much of this work could and should have been done during the demonstrator um, uh, period. I think that's a conclusion that you um, agree with. I, th th this is referring to the BPS, and I didn't have a great deal of involvement with the BPS, but I think the general... Um, a point about doing requirements analysis I agree with. The only point I might disagree with is um, how much of that work they should have done during the demonstrator period because at that point of course there were still three service providers and so I think you'd only expect the um, only expect them to go to a certain point before award a contract having got a water contract, you'd then expect them to uh, to go in heavy to do the, the, the main uh, detailed requirement work. Thank you. And then over the page, please. And then uh, under 2.3.4, other elements of the system, uh, they say... While we have so far only completed work on the BPS system element, we have grave concerns that the same lack of professional analysis will be apparent in other areas as we come to review them. This concern is supported by a number of interviews with authority staff from which it is apparent that Pathway are loath to release design documents to BA Pockle. While they have on occasion cited intellectual, <coughs> excuse me, intellectual property rights, as a reason for refusal, we are becoming increasingly suspicious that the real reason is that the right level of documentation simply has not been developed. Was that a conclusion that you agreed with? I would, yes. Were you one of the people that were interviewed that said that to Project Mentors? I can't remember whether I was... Um interviewed for this specific report. As I say, I'm confused between uh, the, 
the fact there were two different project mentors activities so um, I couldn't be certain I was interviewed for this one. Uh, the next paragraph of particular concern is the EPOS system. <coughs> Excuse me. We are informed that at a relatively early stage, Pathway wanted the authorities, principally Pockel, to be involved with the design of this element. The plan was to use the rapid application development RAD methodology to design the system. This approach was started but discontinued after some months when the Pathway staff member involved left the project. The suggestion to use RAD leads us <coughs> to believe that more traditional methods have not been used and since the RAD experiment was abandoned we have doubts whether any proper requirements analysis has been um, performed. Did you know about what's described in that paragraph? Yes, in that we knew that um, they had they, they wanted to take this uh, RAD approach and we knew the pathway staff member leaving. That was in my uh, uh, report that we saw a few minutes ago. Last, the impacts on the programme in the future. <coughs> they say, our experience of systems where requirements have not been analysed satisfactorily is the system fails to meet the user's needs. An effective acceptance test will identify many such failings, necess necessitating considerable rework. The result is a significant extension of time and cost required to complete the system and roll out. The alternative is to allow unacceptable processing in the operational environment with unpredictable and potentially damaging results. In our opinion, the failure to satisfactorily analyze the requirements for the benefits payment system makes it unlikely that the user's needs will be met by the current and pathway system. Uh, was that a conclusion with which you agreed at the time? Uh, yes. Can we look at your notes, please? WI <coughs> TN 0597 0121. You say at the top, uh, we have no evidence to disagree with the underlying message in this report. Who's the we in that sentence? Uh, I believe we had discussed this with other members of the um, assurance team uh, that um, may have included uh, John Ma, it may have included um, a couple of the uh, benefits agent people. Benefit Benefits agency people who were involved at the time as well. Can we look, please, uh, a couple of the points that you made? The second bullet point um, from the bottom. Um, our view over the past two plus years of experience pathway development has been one, horizon denied visibility, especially of application design. Oddly, we've managed to get some visibility of the risk areas, such as the repost middleware. No opportunity for horizon to perform independent verification and valuation no evidence that Pathway have performed a verification and validation. Those um, two points there, do you, um, by putting the symbol to the left of them, mean that the result of what you describe is that? Yes. And what do you mean by this bullet point as a whole? Um, basically the same message as, as discussed earlier, that we, Horizon, as in the BA Pockel team, had been uh, denied visibility of the application design. Uh, when I say we had some visibility of the risk areas, what I mean by that is the areas where we had raised formal risks to the service provider risk register at the start, such as repost. In those cases, we did get more information, uh, but as far as the application design in particular for EPOS, 
we've been denied visibility. Um, therefore, we had no opportunity for the programme staff to you know, independently go through the design and validate against the requirements. What was maybe of more concern there is that uh, if they didn't have design documentation at that point, then how could they have done it? Bear in mind, it wasn't our job to do it, if you like. It was their job to do it and us to try and uh, get confidence they had done it. Um, that's not in any way meaning to, to, to duck it, but you know, they were the people in the PFI contract who were doing this. If they didn't have the um, design documentation, then how could they assure the um, integrity and correct operation of components such as EPOS? Can we go over the page, please? And look at the first full bullet point. A pathway adopting a, quote, end of pipe, end quote, approach to quality and performance, a fix on fail in testing approach, rather than putting in the effort to get it right um, first time. Um, end of pipe approach. Um, by, by that, I meant that's a you know, term I've used elsewhere in IT. It means rather than trying to uh, you know, do it right all the way through the process, um, through you know, a formal process of requirements, and then design, and then having all the quality processes in place, um, it was more, you know, getting to the end and then uh, fixing See the See what flows out work. of the pipe. Yes. And the fix on fail is something that we actually commented on during the acceptance process as well, where our concern was that um, there was a, a process of, oh, here's another bug, we'll go and fix it, rather than going back and looking at the fundamental problems that led to that point. I understand a, an end-of-pipe approach to be an approach to the treatment of waste that concentrates on treating or filtering the effluent, I'll call it, that flows from a pipe as opposed to making changes to the processes that give rise to the effluent. Is that a fair way of describing it? It's not one I've heard of before, but I can... Uh, can See the analogy, yes. Does that fit with what you were describing here as pathways, end of pipe approach? It's from, it's, it fits from the point of view that what we were seeing, from what they'd exposed to us, they weren't, um, the effort wasn't being successfully deployed to get quality, performance, and whatever right during the development process. It was a matter of at the end of the pipe, when the product came out of the end of the pipe, of then, if there were problems, then fixing it. Fixing the individual problems. I understand. Thank you very much. And then, um, can we look at the last bullet point on the page, please? A pathway, you say, have generally shown an inability or unwillingness to understand or recognize the complete um, requirements um, set. Um, C, the failure to follow the contracted security standards, some whole requirements missed, e.g. timeout back at R1C, etc., have tended to think they can develop a system without being bothered by the detailed requirements or their meaning, uh, failure to use the clarification um, uh, methods. <coughs> uh, what did you mean by that last bullet point? Well, we had um, in place processes so that uh, Pathway could, could bounce questions back to the PDA or back to Horizon. Uh, in particular, on the application side, uh, we had um, uh, at one point uh, teams actually uh, working in Feltham with Pathway, um, seemed not of technical people but of business people, so that questions could be asked and they could actually you know, have um, real ac access to the business experts. And, um, you know, what we 
certainly at a certain point in the process, there didn't seem to be the level of clarifications or questions coming. You know, they wanted to, to get on and in the, the aforementioned black box, get on with developing it. In this document and some of the ones we've looked at before, there has been mention of um, at the EPOS, and you told us a moment ago um, how critical the EPOS was uh, to this system. Did you have any knowledge of the EPOS task force uh, created or appointed by um, Terry Austin? At the time, no. Uh, I don't believe I did. Uh, that's not to say that there may not have been people within the, you know, working at, on, on the, within Felton who did. Uh, subsequently to um, uh, leaving the uh, post office and moving on, uh, I have spoken to people who were involved with Pathway at the time, who, um, you know, on a formal sort of over a pint basis, who did uh, indicate that there was a time when Pathway did pile almost as many people as they get into EPOS to try and fix issues. Uh, and the um, uh, feedback I, I got on that was it wasn't that successful because they seemed to be introducing as as many issues as they were fixing because <coughs> potentially because of the state of the code and potentially because of the uh, absence of design. So you can pile some people who may be good but don't understand an area of code, uh, they will uh, maybe fix one bug and introduce another. Uh, I didn't know it as a task force, uh, unless complementary terms have been used to describe it, but um, they, they, I knew they had, subsequently I had known they had piled people onto it. I think it follows that you um, weren't told of the work of or the conclusions of the task force at the time that it was undertaking its work? Correct. Uh, were you aware of any recommendations in 98, 99, or indeed 2000 circulating within ICL that a rewrite or redesign of EPOS should be undertaken? No. I think, as you've told us um, already, you have recently um, been shown by the inquiry a report um, on the EPOS task force. I wonder whether we could look at that, please. It's FUJ3080690. Is this the document that you referred to um, before and um, after lunch? Yes. As having seen um, recently, yesterday, in fact. Does it follow that you um, were not um, informed of the existence or the contents of this 20-page report back in um, uh, 1998, 1999, or 2000? Correct. Ignore the date on the top right-hand side, um, 14501. We think that's an artefact of um, unknown origin. You'll see the abstract describes the report <coughs> as describing the activities of the EPOS Pinnacle Task Force, which was in place between the 19th of August and the 18th of September 1998, to reduce to manageable levels the EPOS Pinnacles outstanding at that time. In terms of the individuals that are mentioned on the distribution list there. Uh, can you help us as to your understanding of the roles they were performing at, say, September 1998? Uh, Mr. Austin? Well, Terry Austin was, I think, development director or development manager. He was, uh, I believe, responsible overall for the software development. Uh, M. Bennett would have been um, Martin Bennett, who was the director of <coughs> uh, risk and security. Um, Jan Holmes was there. Hold on, um, j just before you uh. move on, um, um, Dee McConnell, did you know? We, we know him to be David McConnell. Uh, no, didn't come across them. Uh, library, obviously, um, is not a person, but e either a physical or a 
in the electronic repository. Um, author Jan Holmes. Was, I, I, I don't know if I ever met Jan, but I, I believe he was the um, audit manager or um, some, some uh, quality and audit role. I think probably working to Martin Bennett. Uh, thank you. Um, before we um, look into a couple of the um, parts of the report, what was your overall reaction when um, this report was revealed to you? Um, uh, kind of uh, annoyance and frustration, because if we'd um, understand, understood everything that was in here, both from the background and from you know, what they did and what didn't happen, uh, I think it would have... Um, it certainly would have changed my attitude to uh, what we were doing. Uh, EPOS wasn't mine as such, but if I'd seen this, uh, <coughs> I would imagine it would have been a subject of major discussion within the PDA and the Horizon um, programme. And I think it would have had a major effect to what happened um, one year later. What major effects um, may it have had a year later? I think um, it probably would have made it far harder for acceptance to have gone through. I think we would have... Well, I think if we'd known of this, there would have been more pressure on potentially trying to do something to understand better the state of the product to the point that it moved from PFI to non-PFI and the BA left. As, I, as I, I do think that was maybe a missed opportunity. But I think... If we'd known the state here, um, then it would have been much more evidence to have a, a more cautious approach when it came to what happened in 1999. Uh, can I um, take you to a couple of passages just before the break, please? Look at page six, please. Uh, you've read this recently. If there are any other parts that you want to draw to uh, the chair's attention, then please do tell us. But if we scroll down to EPOS documentation, Um, section 7.1, the document suite supporting the EPOS product consists of three main um, elements. They're listed. <coughs> All of these were developed by reverse engineering the EPOS product code at that time. Uh, what does that passage in the, um, or what's the effect or the meaning of that passage in the report to you? But well, what that tells me is that design documents, high level and low level design documents, uh, could not have existed. Otherwise, you wouldn't go and reverse engineer documents after you've written the code. So that what that tells me is that the EPOS product code had been written before there was design documentation. And so the suspicion that you had about withholding material wasn't um, was correct. This backs up the fact that. It was, uh, it was withheld in this area because it either didn't exist or didn't exist in a good enough form to give us. Um, and if they said, oh, we haven't got any, uh, you know, we've got to go off and, and re-engineer it, it would have raised alarm bells. Um, over the page to page seven, please. Under EPOS code, section 7.2, it's clear that senior members of the task force are extremely concerned about the quality of uh, code in the EPOS product. J just stopping there, senior members of the task force, that's, um, do you understand that to be referring to ICL itself? Yes, I presume those were the, um, the, the most senior members of the group of half a dozen or whatever they brought into this task force. Earlier this year... <coughs> the EPOS code was re-engineered by ESHA, and the expectation is that the work carried out in Boston was to a high standard of, of good quality. Since then, many hundreds of pinnacle fixes have been applied to the code, and the fear is that code decay will, assuming it hasn't already, cause the product to become unstable. Um, this uh, presents a situation where there is no guarantee that a pinnacle fix or additional functionality can be made uh, without adversely um, affecting another part of the system. Was that something that you knew about at the time? 
we knew that the um, EPOS code had had a trip to um, Boston, we were told, for completion. Um, the rest of that, of um, about the state of the code and uh, fears around code decay, whatever, no. And again, if, uh, if we had known that the EPOS product was in that state, I think the project would have taken a, a totally different path. Um, page 15, please. Uh, scroll down, please. <coughs> 7.1.1, under documentation suite, the EPOS product was originally developed using RAD techniques as part of the joint working agreement in force during release one. This approach carries a number of attendant risks, not least of which is the lack of formal specification. During 1997, the product was sent to ESHA for significant rework as the solution arrived at via RAD was deemed not to provide sufficient integrity. Is that the same point? Uh, that's the point that if you don't go through the design process, then uh, for something that's as um, complex and critical as this, it doesn't have the, uh, it's unlikely to have the um, integrity you require, which seems to be in the case. And then lastly, page 17, please. At the foot of the page under existing code. Although parts of the EPOS code are well written, significant sections are a combination of poor technical design, bad programming, and ill thought out bug fixes. The negative impact of these factors will continue and spread as long as the pinnacle fixing culture continues. This is partly due to the nature and size of the bug fixing task, and partly due to the quality and professionalism of certain individuals within the team. If you had known about that at the time, uh, what, um, if any, would the consequences have been? I think if we'd known about all this at the time, it would have been um, certainly, you know, escalated up to the highest level. I think if we'd known that this still, ex this, had, this much existed, uh, I'm sure the project would have potentially been canned come the point that the... Um, BA withdrew and the decisions were being taken what was going to happen, I think this would have tipped the balance. Thank you. So is that an appropriate moment for um, the afternoon break? Yes, certainly. And um, what's the likely progress this afternoon, Mr Beer? Um, I'm likely to finish um, at about half past four. Um, or dribble over into um, tomorrow morning, and then some other core participants will ask their questions tomorrow morning, I suspect. So, so um, there's no realistic prospect of Mr. Folks finishing this afternoon. I, and I that think so. being so, um, I, I think we should finish about 4.15, 4.20, unless you really would like 10 minutes to finish. Put it like that sort of thing. Uh, no, thank you, sir. <laughs> right, all right. So, uh, 10 minutes now? Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Folks, um, can we turn to um, the position after um, or in the run up to the new contract being signed between? Uh, Pockle and um, ICL Pathway. In your witness statement, you refer us to a paper written by the late Keith Baines, who was Pockle's head of commercial, um, that summarises the contractual position um, in relation to the new agreement that was uh, due to be signed at the end of July 1999. Can we look at that paper, please? It's WITN 0597-0136. you'll see that um, it's a briefing paper on the New Horizon contract. It's um, dated at the top in the box and at the bottom right as the 27th of, oh, sorry, at the top, 27th of July, 1999, at the bottom, 27th of July, 2022. Um, uh, did you um, see this at the time, back in July, 99? Yes. 
This was a document that Keith produced and circulated uh, to um, the, the, the programme as it then was. I presume the uh, date on the bottom right hand corner is just because that's when I printed it. To when you printed it off. To submit. And there's just a coincidence that it was 23 years later. Uh, yeah, things, things that happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm uh, told so that the transcript's down. Thank you very much. We just have to pause for the moment because the transcript has um, ceased to work. Sir, I'm told that we, um, we need to break for five minutes whilst a uh, fix occurs. Fine. Um, I'll, I'll go off screen, but I'll still be in the room, so just speak to me when it's ready, all right? Yes, thank you very much, sir.
Sarah, I understand we're back up and running. So, so I understand, Mr. Beer. I was just responding <coughs> to an email uh, to the effect that I was ready as well. Uh, thank you very much. Good to hear it. Um, can we look, please, at um, the introduction of this document at the foot of the page, <coughs> which describes its purpose? Uh, this paper is prepared as a summary of the main differences between the old and new contracts between Pockle and ICL Pathway following the cancellation of the benefit payment card and the new commercial terms agreed by the Post Office Board on the 24th of May 99. The intended audience is Pockle managers who need to understand the main provisions of the contract, either because they have working contacts with Pathway or because they um, have an interest in the services Pathway will be delivering under the new contract, and you fell within, to that, dis within that description? Yes. Um, over the page, please. Um, on the 24th of May, Pockle and ICL Pathway signed a letter um, agreement that made major changes to the previous contracts between Pockle and Pathway. At the same time, DSS and ICL Pathway agreed to terminate their contract for the benefit payment card services and DSS withdrew from the tripartite authorities agreement. <coughs> uh, the letter agreement specified that Pockle and Pathway should produce a codified contract that incorporated the changes into a new contract by the 16th of July. The, codified, uh, sorry, the codification process has now been completed and the new contract is due to be signed on the 28th of July. That was the next day after this document. There are significant changes to many aspects of the contract um, summarized in the following sections. Uh, would you, um, as a team leader or as a manager, um, have used this document rather than the underlying contracts, um, uh, contract itself to understand the um, relative uh, contractual obligations of each of the parties to it? Um, certainly. I, the, we wouldn't have gone line by line through the, the new contract. We would have used Keith's summary. And we can see in the... Um, the rest of the document, I'm not going to go through it now because it speaks um, for itself if we just scroll, scroll through, through it. Uh, differences in service scope, um, difference in prices. It's uh, modelled on a standard turnkey build and operate contract rather than a PFI based um, usage uh, charging structure. Uh, risk transfer, the new contract significantly reduces the risks that Pathway was uh, previously taking under the PFI, in particular risks in relation to achievability by Pockle of the rollout timescales and in relation to future business volumes are now largely with uh, Pockle. And then over the page, please, to acceptance. Um, about five lines from the bottom of the first paragraph. The thresholds for medium severity acceptance faults have been increased from 10 faults in total to 20 faults overall, so, um, or 10 in any one acceptance specification. The threshold of any um, one high severity acceptance fault still applies. So that amounts to relaxation. Um, is that right? The increase in number of permissible um, medium severity acceptance faults? Yes, relaxation from the point of view of pathway. Sorry, say again? From the point of view of pathway. Yes. Now, the product was designed and the system was designed and developed under a PFI contract when, as you've explained to us, you had um, limited visibility of what was inside the black box. And that was explained by ICL Pathway on the basis that that was the nature of the PFI contract and they were taking the risk under the PFI contract. That's fair? Yes. Now the relationship had fundamentally changed, hadn't it? It had, but we, of course, got to this stage where the products, in theory, um, we were told completed and almost, you know, ready to go into acceptance. So it had the um, it, it ceased to be a PFI, but it was starting from a very strange place for conventional uh, contract. Well, the paragraph we looked at about um, the transfer of risk to pathway that existed under the PFI, that had gone. And yes. now 
um, achievability by POCL of the rollout timescales and future business volumes. Those risks always, um, now rested solely with POCL. Yes. To your knowledge, were the concerns that you, in the documents that we have seen, had been persistently raising about um, technical aspects of um, Pathways system brought into account in the renegotiation of the contract? I don't think they were, no. Do you know why? Uh, I don't. I can hazard a guess, but I don't know. Um, I have no evidence on which, on which to base it. If we look at your witness statement, please, at WITN 0597-0100, at page 42, you say at paragraph 124, <coughs> the new contract was based on the same set of requirements and sadly did not improve our ability to perform assurance on the solution. By the time the new contract was finally signed in mid-99, the system was already claimed to be fully developed. That's the point you just made a moment ago. And in many ways, therefore, the damage was done regarding assurance and, you fear, quality. The contract was signed as acceptance activities were taking place, and the contract had no facility for us to go back and revisit the problems of the previous few years, nor, as far as I can remember, did it give us any further access to detailed documentation. To your knowledge, uh, was any attempt made to stop this from happening, either um, a failure to improve your ability to perform assurance on the solution uh, revisiting the problems of the previous few years or giving you um, further access to detailed documentation? I have no memory of any visibility of that. The contract negotiation was um, was going on um, off at a totally different level um, and I don't think we were uh, consulted as was or anything we wanted to get in there. I think it was being done at some speed and with, with some uh, uh, external pressure, as we've seen. Uh, and I don't think it was never seen to be on the table, you know, uh, nobody coming around saying, you know, what else should we put in here? It might be suggested that there was an unholy rush amongst some to get Horizon done. What would you say to that? There was uh, a lot of pressure to get Horizon done. Um, obviously, the program had been going for five years. There was a big expectation out in the network, the, the network of offices. Um, there were lots of, um, you know, it's like a, a glacier being held back from coming down the valley, uh, you know. Um, Everything was poised from the point of view of um, the big <coughs> 20,000 offices. Um, so there was a lot of pressure on POCL management for it to be done. I think from what we see around acceptance, there was an attempt during the acceptance period to put the brakes on when the number of acceptance incidents came out and some of the issues that came out. I think at the point of view of point of time of signing the contract, there was probably a, a, a lot of pressure to get the contract signed for uh, political and commercial reasons, and, and probably no desire to um, sort of reopen the box by uh, changing the rules, as it were, however beneficial that might have been. In um, paragraph 126 of your statement, if we just scroll down, please. You say, in hindsight, Pockle missed an opportunity to force an in-depth review of the emerging system, including examining all aspects of how the system had been created, 
to mitigate the gap caused by the earlier PFI approach and to require a pathway to open up uh, to Pockle. You say that in hindsight, Pockle missed an opportunity. Was hindsight in fact necessary in order to reach that conclusion or was it obvious at the time? I think I'm just trying to, to, to give you the, the, the most honest answer I can with that. I think after three or four years of, of um, at times it's felt like fighting with pathway from the point of view of assurance, etc. Uh, um, that to me, you know, it was obvious that we should have done something. But there was an incredible amount going on at that point from the point of view of the new contract and whatever. Uh, I don't know whether um, we would have got anywhere if we'd pushed harder, <laughs> if people like for myself had pushed harder to get an in-depth review. I think it was a sort of un un unstoppable um, super tanker at that point. Um, there was a view, I think, that OK, we got through uh, all this period. The assurance process hadn't been a great success for the reasons we've spoken about for several hours. Uh, but now we we're coming up to acceptance and people were going to rely upon the acceptance process and the acceptance uh, testing and acceptance incidents to um, the try and ensure the quality of the system. Um, I don't know if that answers the question or not. Well, you had been um, identifying and reporting in writing serious concerns, and we've seen some of them today. We don't have a record of what you were saying orally um, or via email. Um, sometimes they're even stronger in um, expression. But we've seen the formal documents that you created. Was this um, issue overlooked, i.e., we, we've um, not been able to undertake an in-depth review of the emerging system, including examining all aspects of how the system had been created, or was it known about, but there was a rush to get the system rolled out? I don't think anybody could claim that it wasn't known about. Um, you know, from the number of documents, the amount that uh, myself and others on the team had said, and the, um, you know, they probably got rather bored with us saying it, but we'd been very clear on the message. So I don't think it was not known about. Um, I uh, can't really explain why people uh, didn't, you know, go out and say, okay, what else should we be doing at this stage? You know, the contracts team were renegotiating the contract and their brief, I guess, was to take the contract and um, codify it down to the single contract. You say, was there an almighty rush? Um, from what I have since understood, there was a considerable pressure being put on POCL to be able to move this forward, which probably would have um, uh, not encouraged, yes, you know, reopen the contract and and uh, see what other quality and access requirements we wanted. Thank you. Can I turn to a new topic? Um, audit. Uh, the provision of information and data by ICL Pathway and prosecutions. Can we look, please, at um, your witness statement, WITN 0597-0100, at page 67, please. <coughs> this is within a section of your witness statement when you are looking back at fitness for purpose at rollout. And at paragraph 207, in the third line, 
you say, I think a key question for the inquiry to ask is what gave Pockle such confidence in Horizon to start using it for prosecutions of sub-postmasters, especially after the rather chequered history of the system from 1996 to 2000, and in particular, the experiences of 1999. Can we look, please, at, in addressing that question, um, Fujitsu, F-U-J, 6071. This is the codified agreement of July 1999. And can we turn to page 97, please? And can we look, please, at 418 and 419? <coughs> uh, 418. The contractor shall ensure that all relevant information produced by the Pockle service infrastructure at the request of Pockle shall be evidentially admissible and capable of certification in accordance with the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, the Police and Criminal Evidence Northern Ireland Order 1989, and equivalent legislation covering Scotland. And then in brackets, R829 para 1. Um, what do you understand the reference to R829 para 1 is? Uh, that was a requirement in the requirements catalogue, uh, 829.1. So um, it's part of the specification um, in the requirements, yes? Yes. A cross-reference, if you like, to that? Yes. Um, 419, at the direction of Pockle audit trail and other information necessary to support live investigations and prosecutions shall be retained for the duration of the investigation and prosecution, irrespective of the normal retention period of that information, and then a cross-reference to R829.2. Yes. Now, um, I think it's right that you were probably aware of these two provisions at the time, i.e. back in 1989, sorry, 1999. Um, yes, in the same way I was aware of, of um, most of the provisions in the requirements. Um, the reason I say that is we're going to come in a moment to a, a report that you wrote in the late summer, early autumn of 1999 about the subject of compliance with these two provisions. Before we get there, can we look please at poll three zeros, nine one six five. Poll three zeros two nine one six five. Thank you. Can you see this is a document described as the Horizon System Audit Manual? Yes. Can you um, please summarize at a high level what it is, please? Um, document created by uh, Pathway and it was shared with uh, this version with Post Office Internal Audit, who is POIA. Uh, it had previously an earlier version uh, that I'd referred the inquiry to was shared with other members of Pockle and BA Audit. Uh, and it basically describes in some detail um, the uh, uh, methods of access to audit material by a various different groups of auditors including Pathway Internal Auditors, uh, POCL uh, Auditors, BA Auditors, and, and some other categories of uh, auditors. And uh, in one particular part of it, it does uh, uh, attempt to address the requirements of 829, which is the one that you just referred to regarding... Thank you. We'll come to that in a moment, but I think this is the first time we've looked at 
this, so I just want to introduce it slowly. You see the reference in the top right, I8 man 004. Does that refer to internal audit manual? Uh, I believe that uh, was Pathways um, naming convention, yes. And the version that we're showing you is uh, 1.3, dated the 17th of January 2000, so shortly before you left um, in uh, February 2000. And that's, yes. why, that's why we've picked this one to show you. Okay. Um, I, the, it was a much earlier version, 0.3, which is the only one that I believe I'd ever seen. Yep. Uh, and um, that was one that still had reference to BA on it because it was pre the split. Pre, pre the split. Just looking at the abstract, um, the manual describes the Horizon operational, oper um, operational Support and Commercial Systems and data flows in sufficient detail to enable members of the Horizon audit community to understand them for audit purposes. And then it also addresses the appropriate criteria of requirements, and then some numbers are given, including 829. That's the cross-reference yes. that we looked at earlier. Mm -hmm. Insofar as it provides information relating to the composition of and access to the audit trail as defined in those requirements and its admissibility for PACE certification. So the abstract is, um, the second part of it is probably the most important one for us, is saying that this document addresses requirement 829. Yes. And if we just look, if we scroll down at the distribution list, um, can you just tell us from um, where within each organisation people came from? on the distribution list? Uh, Martin Bennett was the Pathway Director of Risk and Security. Yes. Uh, Chris Painter was from Post Office Internal Audit. So P-O-I-A. I, I think it's Post Office Internal Audit. Post Office audit. Internal Audit. And what did Post Office Internal Audit do? They were the internal audit function of Post Office. I uh, didn't have any... Um, a detailed contact with them, but uh, they would have been considered to be the um, sort of expert domain. Obviously, the, the program sat in a in a role of almost dating agency, if you like, um, bringing in the relevant expert domains from around the organisation, uh, together with the expert domains in Pathway. So, uh, in this case, uh, Chris Painter as POIA was. Um, I don't know where he sat in internal audit, but he would have been their nominated contact and the nominated representative of the audit community in post office who would have needed access to the system. Uh, what relationship did post office internal audit have uh, within the post office, or Royal Mail indeed, for the conduct of investigations and prosecutions? I can't answer that one. Are they... Um, were... POIA responsible in any way for investigation um, or the conduct of criminal investigations? I can't answer that one, I'm afraid. And then library, do you know whose library that is? That would have been, in, in all these documents, the library means the pathway library. Is it a joint library? Uh, no, I believe that's a, a library run by pathway. ICL pathway. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether there were arrangements to share certain documents, but certainly there are plenty of documents at say library that weren't shared. So, uh, And then the other name on there, Paul Redwood, yes. was a member of the uh, PACL <coughs> Horizon team. And what so, position did he hold? The name doesn't really ring a bell. I presume it may have been within the... Um, No, I, I couldn't really make a good guess. It's, um, so it's an ICL pathway document. Yes. Um, what do you know about Pockle's contribution to it or review of it? There was an earlier version of it, uh, and there were two uh, POCL people on it. Um, two other names. One, I think, was a Hillary Stewart. Yes. Uh, and the other was a Jason Carter. I don't personally know or didn't know either of them, but I presume 
uh, they represented the uh, audit community. And I believe Hilary Stewart uh, contributed comments to this document in that there's reference to uh, comments from HS further down in the change history. Yes, if you go over to page three, please. <coughs> At the foot of the page. I think we can see under um, changes V1.2 to 1.3, for some reason, Hilary Stewart and a lady called Ruth Stinchcombe were removed from the distribution. In any event, this is a 68-page document, and I'm only going to draw your attention to some of it. Um, can we turn, please, to page 53? We should just look um, at the previous page, I'm sorry, to get the heading. Uh, retrieving and extracting audit data, 10.3. And then scroll back to where we were. Um, overview. <coughs> and I'm going to ask you to translate this in a moment. Um, this is where audit data is retrieved from the DLT based on requests for information made by post office internal audit and presented for further extraction or placed on CD-ROM or other suitable media for dispatch to the request for information originator. The uh, following paragraphs are ordered to reflect the actual processing of a request for information by ICL Pathway Internal Audit. Can you just translate um, what that's saying, please? Uh, DLT stands for digital something or other tape. It's a, a storage medium. Yes. So my understanding is that audit data uh, would, if you go up to the previous diagram, if we can just go up one page, um, I believe we should see um, there are tapes on the bottom left, left hand side. So data gets written to tapes. I believe Pathway had a an infrastructure that pulled data from a number of points in the system, including of interest interest to us here. What's called the TMS Journal, which was the um, Transaction Management Service Journal the data coming up from offices. That data was stored on uh, DLT, I, from what I remember, probably on a daily basis. And what the um, pathway internal audit could do is retrieve that data as per request and copy the data onto CD-ROM, a compact disk, um, to give to a authorised post office internal audit person. Back to um, the next page, please. 10.3.2, <coughs> POIA, Post Office Internal Audit, will request audit data via request for information form. This will contain a description in business terms of the dates, sorry, of the times, outlets, events, items, and activities that the auditors are interested in. This request has to be interpreted by Pathway Internal Audit and mapped onto the audit points and files described earlier in this manual. I'm not going to um, take you to those. Can we go over the page, please? To 10.4.2, um, which may be an important paragraph. Investigation support. Uh, the term investigation is used in its broadest sense and does not limit itself to fraud. Any uh, RFI is likely to be associated with a specific business event, e.g. an encashment, a bill payment, an outlet, a beneficiary. It is anticipated that the majority of this type will be based on the TMS journal or will use it as a start point. Um, C 11.2, uh, which we looked at, which we can look at, um, for details of how to raise an RFI. Can you um, translate what that's saying for us, please? Uh the statement's basically just saying that investigation doesn't necessarily mean um, fraud investigation, but anything that BOCL need to investigate, um, that typically that would be, you'd be able to start by, you know, it may be a specific event such as a specific, specific transaction or in a specific outlet that would trigger it. And it's saying the majority of the type, this type of retrieval 
we base on the TMS journal. The TMS journal is, I believe, the term they use for the message store centrally, yes. which is, uh, by nature of a post, the image of the message store uh, in the office. So that's the uh, if you like the raw data that EPOS will have written in the office once it's replicated up to the centre. Is then I believe um, uh, archived onto tape from there, and it's bringing back that data from tape to give the journal that would then be available for the investigator. <coughs> Thank you. Over the page, please. Uh, obtaining access to operational audit data. This is under the heading requirement 699. Um, so far as um, I can see, th there isn't a um, specific heading dealing with requirement 829, which is the one that we were interested in. But under requirement 699, if we scroll down, please, to the bottom of the page, there is something that may be of interest at the last part on the page, access to Pockle audit trails, particularly the TMS journal, is seen as a strict Pockle preserve. If any third party uh, requires access to it for evidential purposes or fraud investigation, then the access will be via post office internal um, audit. If I can just explain what's behind that paragraph. Yes, please. Um, apart from, if you like, the obvious, which is PO, internal audit is the conduit into pathway. Um, when it was still a joint contract, there were many uh, joyous debates between BA and Pockle regarding access to information. And if you had a potential, uh, mostly around benefit encashment fraud, if there'd been benefit and punishment forward down on a counter terminal, the question then came up, is that data BA's data or Pockle's data? Because it's sitting within the Pockle domain, but it may relate to a BA transaction. And I think all this was actually saying is that uh, if it was data down on the POCL counter terminal, then access to that data, even if it referred to um, a BA transaction would need to go via POCL. Looking at, um, thank you, looking at um, the document as a whole, and I think you've had a chance to read it, and I think I've drawn your attention to those parts of it that um, could or could possibly um, be a reference to carrying requirement 829 into effect. What's your view as to whether this document adequately addresses from an operational and practical level um, the translation of 829 into reality? Obviously, the document doesn't make any reference to any form of um, certification or any form of... Um, uh, doesn't cover anything apart from direct access to the data. Uh, so, to, uh, just sorry, just stopping there. You're making the point, I think, that... The document is um, focused on obtaining access to data rather than the provision of a statement or a report that certifies accuracy or integrity. Is yes. That right. Uh, and the, I think this is very much looking at it from an operational stroke technical point of view. So it goes into great detail on, uh, if you like, the integrity of the audit trail, how it's pulled off, etc., but not around. Uh, anything rather than, say, the provision of statements or whatever is maybe required by PACE. Uh, and if I don't know where that would have been, that other part would have been covered. Is uh, it right that you um, took some steps to try and get that other part, i.e. compliance with PACE, covered? So... I believe in the original contract there were the same, those two requirements, but as applied to, in the BA contract, they were slightly different. We're going to come to that in a moment. Just okay. generally, did you make some effort to try and um, ensure that requirement 829 was translated into practical effect 
so that systems and processes were created at a practical level to ensure that it could occur? I didn't personally, but, um, you know, without dodging the question, uh, the Ground 829 and audit wasn't part of my remit. Did you, write, did you write a paper suggesting that it be done? We um, did have, that there was a, um, there was one piece of work I was asked to look at in middle of 90, um, August, September 1999, where uh, I was passed, I think, by possibly Dave Miller or Bruce McNiven, uh, a document that Post Office Internal Audit had written that made various comments about um, audit and investigation access. And um, I did respond back to either Dave, uh, Dave Miller or Bruce McNiven around that, and it did cover the fact that, uh, in particular, there seemed to be a gap regarding the provision of a, um, a paste, uh, I don't want to use the term loosely, but witness statement, um, and that um, that seemed to be something that had been dropped out in the contract and would need to be taken forward. Thank you. So, so I was trying to flag, you know, I'm not an expert in this area, but this is something that would, should, should need to be resolved. So as we're on this topic, uh, would you mind if I just spent 10 minutes finishing it off? No, you, you carry on, Mr. Beer. Uh, can we look, please, at that paper, um, WITN 0597-0134? If we can just um, blow it up a little bit, thank you. Just um, scrolling down to start with, if you can scroll down, please. Can I just say this? The bits that are in boxes are my comments. That's what I was about to ask. The bits that are in boxes are my comments. I was passed uh, this paper by either, either, I think, Dave Miller or Bruce McNiven and um, you know, asked to comment on it. Um, and I, my comments are here in the, in the boxes. So bits in the boxes are your writing. Bits outside the boxes are um, part of the pre-existing um, content of the document. Yes which was, I believe, written by somebody in Post Office Internal Audit, but I don't have their name. Thank you. So if we just go up to the top of the page, please. Um, under the introduction, a review of the Horizon cash account system was undertaken following a request from the Horizon program director. The objectives of the audit were reflected in the terms of reference, which were agreed with him on the 15th of July, 99. At, at about that time, July 1999, who was the Horizon Programme Director within Pockle? I presume that was still Dave Miller. Okay, thank you. But um, it would either have been Dave Miller or Bruce McNiven. It was agreed that this review would be undertaken in two stages, and this report reflects the findings from the second stage. Management summary, um, POSIS, um, investigations at outlets. Does POSIS stand for Post Office Security and Investigation Services? I believe so, yes. We are extremely concerned to be informed during the review that POSIS currently do not have access to archived data from the system. Data on the system is compressed and archived after 35 days. It was originally intended that access would be gained via the fraud risk management server, which formed part of the benefits payment system and has now been withdrawn. <coughs> this means the business could be in a position where it's unable to investigate potential frauds or prosecute cases due to the unavailability of critical data. Just stopping there, um, you explain in your witness statement the inclusion of the FRMS, the fraud risk management server, um, in the original contract, the tripartite uh, mm -hmm. arrangement, and its withdrawal when um, uh, the new contract was signed in July 1999. Yes. Um, 
have you any comment to make on that paragraph yeah. there? Uh, well, I, the paragraph shows a degree of confusion amongst the, the writer. Yeah. Um, the fraud risk management service was one of the components that was uh, contracted for by BA. It was created specifically for the benefit encashment service or the benefit payment service. And the idea was that as far as introducing the payment by plastic card uh, to coming on for 20 million benefit recipients, there would need to be um, a potentially control of encashment fraud. And the FRMS was a uh, service that I think was in the requirements and that Pathway um, proposed a solution for to have specific uh, reports and um, mechanisms to flag up potential fraud within the encashment process. Uh, as examples of this, I um, went back and checked. One of the examples was, for instance, if an office did more than its expected number of foreign encashments, a foreign encashment being um, where somebody was away from home, you might get an office if it's suddenly find that its normal list of number of foreigns was 5% and actually it was 80%, it may indicate fraud. There was also something called casual agents where people could go in uh, without a card and if an office got a higher number than that, it might indicate fraud. So the FRMS was very much intended not for prosecution support, not to get audit data, but as a means of managing benefit encashment risk and identifying high-risk activities. When BA withdrew, uh, FRMS ceased to exist because uh, it was a BA service. It also wouldn't have been relevant because I think there was only one report, which was something around out-of-hours transactions, but everything else was uh, benefit encashment specific and therefore it would have had nothing to do. Uh, it was never intended that uh, POSIS or any of the post office um, audit or investigation people would go in via FRMS to get this kind of data. <coughs> Over the page, please. <coughs> Do you explain that, I'm not going to go through it, in paragraphs four, five, and six, where you begin, there appears to be some confusion? Uh, I do, yes. And just to say, the, the only thing I would say is on para five, what I'm saying is um, there were quite reasonable arrangements between POCL security and investigations and the BA equivalent, who were called organised fraud, to share data because if there were um, if there was fraud regarding benefit encashment, it may be appropriate to share it. But um, it wasn't ever intended that uh, Pockle would have to go to BA organised fraud to get information on, um, you know, an office uh, having a problem with its cash account or doing a bill payment transaction. Thank you. Um, if we just move down to paragraph seven, please. You say. A documented process has been established between Pockle and ICL Pathway for access to historical audit information from, po from Pathway's central systems under the auspices of the requirements on audit, requirements 699 and 829, using um, an RFI procedure. This process involves the exchange of the RFI and data between nominated individuals in the audit domain, believed to be originally Hilary Stewart and now Chris Painter of Pockle National Audit and Jan Holmes of ICL Pathways Audit Team. All requests from Pockle would therefore need to be fed through the nominated audit contact. This process is documented within the Horizon Audit Manual, IA MAN 004. That's the audit manual that we just looked at. Correct. Over the page, please. The original authors wrote, Bob Martin also advised us that um, S and IE, Security and Investigations Executive, had requested an expert witness statement from Pathway to support a prosecution, and that this had been refused on the grounds that there was no contractual requirement. John Cook advised us that there is a contractual requirement for Pathway to ensure that the system meets the requirements of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. 
there is a need for Pathway to agree with the Security and Investigation Executive and Internal Audit how this requirement will be met, as well as the procedures for obtaining this evidence when needed for prosecutions. And then you, um, in your box, say the requirement H29.1 is actually, and you set it out, yes? Yes. An outstanding AI acceptance incident, number 370 low, exists against the Pockle requirement on the assertion by Pockle that Pathway should produce a witness statement to support prosecution. This AI revolves around the interpretation of, quote, ensure that all relevant information is evidentially admissible. Pockle's view is that to be admissible, it will need to be supported by witness statements, etc. Pathway have stated that they will, quote, provide pace statements as necessary to support a fraud prosecution, but that, quote, the work required to produce draft witness statements <coughs> is not within the scope of the requirement and will be done once Pockle raise a change request. This issue has been handled with Pathway by Bob Martin and Paul Harvey of SIE. The acceptance incident is still open and its resolution would appear to be primarily a commercial issue, i.e. to do with money. Yes. And then you say this in square brackets, and I think this is what you were alluding to earlier. Note that the benefits agency had similar requirements, R741 and 780, covering their aspects of the service, mirroring the above, above section. However, these had an additional clause, reading the contractor shall provide certification in accordance with PACE, and PACE NI and equivalent Scottish legislation when necessary for a pro proposed prosecution. And then this, to demonstrate that the service infrastructure was operating within normal parameters at time of an alleged offence. This additional clarifying clause was lost at the time of withdrawal of BA at contract codification. But in any um, effect, it strictly only referred to PASS and CMS, both BA services, even prior to BA withdrawal. Attempts were made to get this clause inserted into the codified agreement to apply to Pockle, but without success. Clearly, a process does need to be agreed between Pockle SIE and ICL Pathway for the commissioning of PACE certification statements and court appearances. Firstly, um, how do you know that attempts were made to get the previously um, uh, worded clause inserted into the codified agreement as it applied between Pockle and uh, ICL Pathway, but without success? Uh, I don't know for certain, but I imagine that I went off and spoke to John Cook. John Cook, having been mentioned earlier on, uh, John Cook worked within Keith Baines's team uh, on the contract. And the so last sentence, clearly a process does need to be agreed for the commissioning of PACE certification statements and court appearances. To your knowledge, what happened? I don't know what happened with this in that I was asked to comment on this by, I think, Dave Miller, and I returned this back to... Um, Dave Miller, I believe. Then lastly, if we can look at page five of the document, please. Under conclusion, the original author or authors say, there is a need to ensure that the problems related to the audit trail for SNIE investigations and demonstrating that the system meets the requirements of PACE have been impact assessed as the incidents as incidents and are considered by the acceptance and release authorization boards if not satisfactorily uh, resolved. In addition, it will be necessary to consider whether the current level of cash account errors will affect the accuracy of settlement with clients when considering the rate at which the system should roll out. What is Mr. Miller or um, whoever wrote this saying in that last paragraph? Uh, it wouldn't have been Mr. Miller because it would have been the auditor who... Sorry. Um, what, what is the order sa auditor saying to The auditor in that Mr. last um, paragraph is, is making the uh, statement that with the level of uh, errors that 
were being reported at this point, which was uh, September, I think. Sorry, I can't remember the date, but top of this. But it was being um, reported in, in late summer 1999 that um, it would that that level of errors would affect the ability of the Puckle, Puckle uh, back end to manage settlement with clients. Clients, in this case, means uh, the companies for whom POCL does work, such as, um, you know, BT or the water companies or British Gas or whatever. So to your knowledge, was anything done with this, um, the recommendations made by this paper, whether as originally authored by the auditor or, or as amended or commented on by you? I don't, didn't have any visibility of uh, anything being done with it. Um, but I, I believe it would have been, it, I presume something was put in place in that, clearly, uh, for um, better or worse, there was a process put in place for um, the production of expert witness statements. And I, I presume there was also um, processes were better exercised as far as retrieval of audit data. But I, um, this was, at, at that point, this is one of these jobs which, uh, no, I was, um, you know, set the task by, I believe, Dave Miller, comment on this paper, I comment on the paper and went back. Um, this was about the time when a number of tasks were being passed away from uh, people on the programme like myself, who eventually would disappear, uh, into business service management. And I think a number of the activities as far as uh, communication with uh, Fujitsu or with Pathway as far as access, etc., would have then moved to be managed by business service management. So a, a likely place it might have ended up might have been in, in BSM. Thank you, Mr. Folks. So it's half past four. Um, I've got about ten minutes more, which I would propose to um, pick up tomorrow morning. Yep, fine. All right. And um, uh, we'll start again at ten o'clock tomorrow morning then. And no doubt, um, Mr. Folks, you'll be equally glad not to speak about your evidence overnight. I shall go and find a restaurant where nobody knows me. Yeah, fine. Very good. See you in the morning. Thank, Thank you very much, sir.